First off, I'm Steve Spinker with Remax Carousel. Um, most of you know me. I've been a part of this group, this awesome group, for four years. Four, maybe even five, I'm not sure. Um, I was invited by Peter, who is not here. Um, he invited me about 11, 10 or 11 years ago. God, maybe even longer than that. Right when the group first started up as an electrician. And I was so busy at the time, I kind of passed on it. And I thought, that's kind of weird. Like, why would I network like that? I didn't get networking back then. Um, that was right about when I shut down my company. Downsized to, well, anyway, I'll get into that. But um, this is a great group. And actually that picture, <laughs> believe it or not, I paid, paid for professional pictures when I became a real estate agent. And uh, that picture is actually from my brother's wedding. And uh, I just cropped it out. It's, Wasted all that money on professional picture, and then I said, "Because <laughs> <there, so. laughs> I feel I look better with sunglasses than without." But um, but anyway, um, anyway, I'm Steve Spinker. I've been doing this a little while, so you guys all have heard me spiel about what I can do and everything. So we'll talk a little bit today about um, about the market and about everybody's big fears and the, the social media and. This, everybody's access to all the information. So everybody in this room and all your friends are all real estate experts, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody yes. knows mm -hmm. what's happening. And they, they'll come up to me on a daily basis and tell me, when's the bubble? When's the bubble? The bubble's happening. I've seen red arrows on the red fins telling me it's a bubble. So we'll talk about all that today. Um, so a little about me. Um, before I was, a, I started out as a, Union commercial electrician, but before that, I was in school. I went to OCC, I mean, not OCC, Monterey Peninsula College, MPC, up north, Northern California. Studied uh, electronics, computers, didn't know which direction I was going. I was doing welding, I was working in the glass business. I just kind of touched everything and as a part time, and that was all part time. And then I raced professionally motorcycles at the exact same time. Then my girlfriend, who almost became my wife, but didn't. She, uh, she talked me out of it and told me to grow up. So we moved down here back to where I was born and I signed up to become an, uh, an electrician. Now I'm fifth generation electrician, um, union electrician. My great, great grandfather was the original treasurer of the local 11 union in LA. Um, so my dad was very happy that I did this and it, it worked out okay. So um, I became a union electrician for years, worked my way up, ran projects up to $40 million. It was like my largest. Um, anybody know who Hyperion in El Segundo? Okay, I worked on um, an IPS building. I built a switch yard, $35 million switch yard, $42 million IPS. It's just a pumping station. Had 40 foot screws that just lifted water up. 40 foot by 15 foot, these big screws. They look like actual sheet metal screws, but they were huge. And we put these 4160 motors on the end of them and they would just lift water up and just let it drop. And that's all it did. It was $40, $40 million just for the electrical. Um, and uh, so I worked on stuff like that. And uh, then I decided, you know what? I'm pretty good at this. So I'm gonna get start my own business. So I became a union electrical contractor and I was fairly successful at it. And then 9-11 uh, hit and things started to slow down and I got stuck. I was doing all these cell sites. And I got stuck with all this material. I had a warehouse about this size, loaded with conduit, reverse service receptacles. I probably had 40 grand and stuff that I couldn't even use anymore. So I was just like, okay, well, this is not good. So I downsized and um, then I met Peter. That's about when I met Peter. And then I became a residential electrical contractor and I just had a couple of guys and we did, um, I worked for, uh, it would now be a they, I can't even, now I'm drawing a blank on the company, but they, they um, we, I built banks for them all over the place. Um, we did small commercial and residential. And then um, I ran into uh, this guy, I forget where it was. I ran into him. He ended up owning a, a brokerage in his name and uh, his name was Dean Zitko. And he asked me, he saw my truck. It might've been a Home Depot or something. And he, and he goes, hey, can you do a little job for me? And I did a job for him and anyway. Turns out I'm, I'm working for like 50 of his real estate agents, okay? So I'm just like full-time working for realtors and I'm kind of getting the, the feel of this. And then I get involved in some flips and I'm investing in it and I'm working with these realtors and I'm going, man, these are the most 
I hate to say it, you know, like, I'm going to, I'm going to be nice. Most of them are unprofessional. There are some good ones, but the unprofessionalism, the lack of work ethic, everything that went along with realtor, it's, you know, the old joke about the skid marks before the, before the lawyer in the intersection, you know, they found him dead and it was like, you know, six inches of skid marks. Well, for a realtor, there is no skid marks. It's just piled <laughs> through, right? So I was like, there's a spot in, in this business for me. And at the same time, I was, uh, I just, my youngest son, he was six. I wanted to raise this child. I didn't want to send him to school and daycare like I did the other two. So I talked to my wife. I became a real estate agent. I drove my son to school and I drove him to school for eight years. Um, so I was excited about that, but I, I became this realtor and I wanted to be different. And I've told this story to all you guys before is I am not that realtor. I, I've, I've got, um, background we'll get into and things like that but that's why I got into it was I saw a place in this business for somebody like myself and I wasn't sure it was going to work but obviously it did it's missing something there it goes <laughs> so what separates me from the rest so I started talking about this a little bit but the basic one is work ethic. I'm a contractor. I've, I've worked, I was 10 years old. I got a paper out. I've worked since I was 10. I'm 59. So it's a lot of years. Um, I'm not going to throw a sign up in somebody's yard and sit back and wait for somebody to call me if I answer the phone, because they don't answer the phone, and uh, write an offer or have somebody call me and go, how come you didn't how come you didn't uh, respond to my offer? Oh, you sent me an offer? Where is it? Like, that, I literally get that response when I call agents. I'm like, how come you haven't responded? Oh, you sent me an offer? Can you resend it? <laughs> resend it? Okay, so um, anyway, so I will work for you. I'm going to show up. I'm going to bust my hump. I'm going to, because this all goes on my record. And then we'll talk about my record a little bit later. But I not only want to help my clients make money, get it done, and move on my record too it's kind of like a um, stat sheet for an NFL player a running back how many yards they get per game how many houses can I sell in one day all of them except one okay uh, well not one day one weekend but anyway so one of the things that you get with me is you get targeted marketing and a lot of realtors like I said stick signs up in the yard they'll throw it on the MLS and sit back and go oh, I can't wait to collect that commission check oh it's coming it's coming it's coming I don't do that I, I want it sold. So what I do is, well, I've sold every house since I've been a um, real estate agent in 12 years in one weekend. Okay. I've had 44 listings now, I think, and all 44 minus one have been sold. And it wasn't just in this last year and a half, two years where the market was crazy and everybody thinks they're a rock star. It was actually when rates were five and a half percent, like three years ago, and nobody was buying. Okay. I was still selling in one weekend. So this one house, March 2020, we all know about that month, right? So I, got, I signed this listing um, right before the pandemic. 1.65, I think is what we were going to list it for. Well, we put it on the market in June. You couldn't get a loan, Paul, my partner there. You couldn't even get loans for jumbo loan. So there was just no way to sell this house. I couldn't get people in. I couldn't have an open house. You had to wear protective gear, gloves, boots one person at a time, you can't touch anything, you know, it was, just, it was absolutely crazy. So I'm, I'm sitting there on this house, there's four other houses for sale on the same block, okay? Nothing selling, 90 days, 120 days, you know, a year. And I come in there and these people wanted to sell. So, so we put it on the market and I didn't get anything. So I think like after eight days, I got one showing. So I was like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna make this happen? Who is working right now? Okay. Doctors and nurses. They were the ones working. So what I did is I go, I had my, my title rep pull up everybody that lived in this complex. It's a gated community. It's called uh, Crystal Air in Huntington Beach. Like everybody that was buying in there was a doctor, pretty much. And I was like, oh, I need to market to doctors. So I circled. In my marketing, USC, I circled all these large hospitals and I pounded it. I spent $1,500 in social media on marketing. Guess what? Three days later, 
I had four dollars <coughs> writing off of this house. Okay, so I got this house sold after negotiations. It took me um, a little less than three weeks to get it sold. All the other houses were still sitting there. Four months later, all the other houses are still sitting there. Mine was the only one that sold like within <coughs> God, how many months? Actually, the doctors that came to my house actually went and looked at the other houses and didn't even write offers on them because they were so old. They're like, oh, what's wrong with them? You know, that's something we'll talk about as a stale listing. Okay, I'm, I hate even mentioning this. Ethical. That should be standard in business. All you guys are ethical. I wouldn't be here if you weren't. Um, I hate to say it. I didn't learn about this until I became a real estate agent. F being ethical is not part of the deal. They're, they're most of them, not all. I know some good ones. But most of them, when they get into a situation, they're going to cross the line. They'll take a listing for money that they say they're going to sell it for just to get the listing. And then here comes the reduced price or the whatever down the line. Um, what separates me is my construction background. I feel that's huge. When I'm holding my open houses, I can walk through a house and I can talk to They ask, well, what's wrong? What about this? And my, my construction, construction knowledge, I can't tell them how they should fix it, but I can suggest, and I suggest, oh, well, this is a neat, you know, simple thing here. You could probably get a contractor in here to do this and this. And, you know, and then they go, oh, okay. And they, they talk to me about things. I just, I could build a house. Basically, I've, I've been involved in building. Um, I don't have the experience that Paul and Pierre and all these guys have, but I could build a house from scratch. Um, my numbers speak for themselves. And, uh, like I was talking about earlier, I've got these numbers and I hate to give up. I've got that one flaw in my record, but it is during COVID and it's during the lowest spike of uh, the lowest we hit in real estate since like 2006. So, um, go ahead. So here's what everybody wants to talk about. Will prices plunge? No, mark my words, they will not plunge. They haven't plunged. They're not going to plunge. Nothing's going to happen unless the government decides to bring rates up to like seven, eight, nine, ten percent. Then I could see see a problem. Everybody's working. We people can't even find employees. You know. Um, anyway, so go ahead. Please. Why is it not going to plunge? Well, that's exactly why. Versus 2006, we've got a lot of equity. People are working. And um, the market is strong. 70% of everybody in Southern California is paying less than three and a half percent interest on their loans. 70%. How many people want to move when you're paying? I'll, I'll brag about my rate 2.35. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, why would I sell? 2.35. So that's what we're up against. People are not going to sell. I mean, 5% is not bad money. 5.5% is not bad money. My first house, I paid 12% for. Yep, I second, remember that too. My I second house, thing. when I was a contractor, it was six and three quarters. But guess what I had to pay? I had to pay 20% down. People don't pay 20% down. I had to pay 20% down and two points to buy that house because I was a contractor. They didn't give contractors loans. You don't have an income. Look, well, look what I've made. Well, are you going to make that next year? You know, they didn't, there's just no way. So I paid eight and three quarters for my second home. So yes, the market is strong. Nobody's leaving. People are working. Their payments are low. They all have these long 30-year loans at, low, at a low housing payment. They get their families are staying with people now. You're like my kids, my third is moving back in with me next week. So I've got, I'm going to have my family back with me. It is too difficult for my oldest to, to survive right now. Um, there's other issues with this person, but I'm just saying that, that, that it's, it's difficult to survive out there. We've all talked about it. Anyway, go ahead. Okay, here's the numbers. This is why I can guarantee to everybody that this market is not going to crash. There is no bubble. It's based on facts. It's not based on fear. All these people on the internet, you go on YouTube and you listen to these so-called experts and they're just pounding you with fear. Oh, the housing bubble, don't buy nothing. Everything's gonna explode, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Today, well, this was actually a couple days ago. We're at 30,000 homes, okay? Active listings in uh, Southern California, okay? 
Last year, we were at 19,000, almost, almost 20,000. So we're about a 10,000 right here, 10,000 home differential. Okay. So, uh, so we're going to talk about peaks. Okay. So normally we hit our peak. We'll see that on the next slide. You can see this peak. This peak happens. This is the last three years. It happens every time in the same spot. You notice that? Okay, go ahead and hit the next slide. Okay, here's when it happens. July to September, right where we're at right now. But we hit it early. Look at where this thing started turning. Okay, right here. Look at this, flat, flat. This one here, this, that was uh, 2019. So in 2019, we had 10,000 more homes on the market than we do now, and it was a good market. Okay. Go ahead. So it's supply versus demand. So we're fighting it out right now. There's no supply and there's the demand has dropped, but it's dropping together. It's not like this is dropping and demand's high or demand is dropping and this is going up. They're, they're following the same trajectory. Go ahead. Here's the big one. So 2006, this is what you call a bubble. It's called inventory. Houses were sitting on the market 200 plus days. That is not a buyer's market. I mean, that is a buyer's market. That is not a seller's market. We are still in a seller's market or in a slight seller's market. We're at 79 days right now. Now these, these averages, these are averages. Last year, we were at 33 days, okay? That is a smoking hot market for an average real estate agent, 33 days. For me, all over, the, over all these three years, if you go back 12 years, it's two days. So I don't fit into any of these averages. I actually throw all these averages off, but I wasn't around in 2006. I watched it, but I wasn't around. But that shows you for us to get to 200 days, look where we're at now, we're already going down. So we we hit that that gap that I was showing you guys earlier on the last slide, where we generally in the fall we start to trickle down on on um, active inventory and demand and everything like that. But we've already the market's already getting hot again. Look, it's turned down. Days on market are dropping right now. In the fall, it's unheard of. It is absolutely unheard of. So when we hit spring, guess what's going to happen next year? Any 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 guess out there? Uh, get worse. It's going to get the prices are going to go up. Yeah, days on market are even going to drop more, and we're hitting on the trajectory of three to five percent, like just like normal Southern California real estate for the next God knows how long. I feel that we've hit our ten year low. That was it. Boom, you saw it. You know, ten years. We've been waiting 10, 12 years for this low, and it went think and back up. COVID blocked it completely out where we were naturally supposed to come down. And now I, I feel three to 5% for at least the next four to five years. So if you don't buy now, you're gonna pay another 20% in five years is the way I feel. Go ahead, I think that's it. Thank you. You sold in Arizona. No, I don't, I can't, I wish I could. I can sell anyone in California. I'm not licensed in any state, um, but I, I do have people that I know in other states. Do you think other states will them to go up to like they have here? But you know what's happened and it's funny and the guy that I follow that, I mean, I'm just, I, I don't have this kind of time to look up all this information. Obviously I pay for a service and I know a guy and I actually have been coached by him. Um, He's explained it as the way the world has changed. We are a global economy now. Everybody knows that. Look at how affected we were during COVID, right? The whole planet was affected by COVID and the, the supply chains and I mean, gas prices. Go to Europe right now. You know, you think we have gas price issues. So um, it's the same way with real estate in our country. It didn't used to be like this. California used to be its own little thing. Well, what, what's happened? Californians have moved away. And what did we do to other markets? Pissed them off. We pissed them off. We brought all of our money and our riches 
and we've come into Idaho, Texas, and Arizona, and we've come in and we're like, we'll pay 100,000 more than you, boom. What happens? Well, now you have a comp, now you have another comp. So we've driven up prices. So everything kind of, we're kind of like, I mean, I'm sure it's cheaper in the Midwest, but everything kind of is working together now. And I think that obviously in, in you know, like the worst possible areas where it's, you know, desert and dust and, you know, whatever, I'm sure property is going to drop there first. Like we can even see it in Southern California. You can go out to San Bernardino, Hemet, unfortunately Hemet's under fire. I shouldn't even say that. Um, Hemet, anybody have seen that Hemet fire? Oh, yeah, I didn't know it was still burning. Oh, it's, God, it's crazy. Yeah, it's like 40,000 acres. Um, we will see, that's the first notch, okay? It's less desirable, right? So it's gonna be, it, it gets hit here. Um, Huntington Beach, Newport, even during 06, did get affected, but nothing like any, at, in, anywhere else. So if you plan on buying around here, you know, it, it's gonna stabilize. But um, I'm seeing everything stable, rents are high. I don't think anything's gonna change. Because you have the influx of population yeah. from around the globe coming yeah. to Southern California, yeah. generally speaking, and then it's dispersing outward. And, you know, like Raphael's <clears throat> talked about many times, we have a housing shortage here, and we still do, you know? Yeah. And it's Raphael's services. And one thing, one thing I forgot to mention, and this is a huge fact that nobody talks about online, and it's a huge fact, I've seen it, and it's there, and it kind of scares the crap out of me. So... There was this listing I just sold in my neighborhood. I closed on it like three or four weeks ago. There was another listing that listed before mine. Okay. It's always a bad, bad call when they can't sell. So I come on the market, right? And everybody's like, well, that one didn't sell. You know. So anyway, they listed it too high. It wasn't marketed properly. And it sat there. I sold, I closed. A couple weeks later, all I was laughing. I was actually Mark going around the neighborhood marketing, going, "Now ah, look, see, you want to pick that person or you want to pick me?" And I was kind of like joking around. And then it sold, and it closed in three days. Well, what it is is Wall Street is buying up any listings that sit for any amount, lengthy amount of time that they feel that they can make money on. Well, they're turning them into Airbnbs. Um, very rarely renting them. Usually, it's short-term rental, but they will rent them. So you've got these huge companies out there buying up real estate and they're just building these portfolios and what it's doing is it's like eliminating the middle class like we're you pretty soon there won't be any place for you to buy because they're not going to sell these properties and why does property not drop in price because of inventory it's supply and demand so if they keep the inventory low right mm -hmm. our price is going to drop no they're padding their wallets every time one comes on the market that's not selling buy it up boom Oh, now that there goes more inventory because if we could get a get a collective amount of, of listings that aren't selling, you would see prices drop 1%, 2%, 3%, pretty soon start dropping, right? That's not going to happen because they buy them up, at least in these nice areas they are. I don't know. I can't say so much for inland. I do know in Orange County, they're buying them up. Like, I mean, even in Garden Grove, I mean, they're buying them everywhere. You know, they're buying Garden Row is actually a really hot market. Um, it's still all cash there. So, uh, so they're they're hurting. They're they're sitting back, going, "Well, we're, they're doing speculation on buying real estate, but they're also patting their wallet, knowing that if they keep buying up these staggering listings, prices aren't going to come down." Right? So they're back in their play. You know, it's kind of like uh, I guess like biggest bet. I mean, lay down money and get back it. You know, so you're like doubling down. So anyway. Any other questions? Yeah, Steve, um, <clears throat> Zillow was doing that. Yeah. And then Zillow got in trouble. Yeah. How is Wall Street doing it differently? I don't understand. They're, they, aren't, they aren't calling themselves um, brokers like Zillow was. Yeah. Zillow was buying homes. So you go online, you were able to take a picture of your house inside, one bedroom, one bedroom, and then upload it to their system, and they tell you what they're going to pay for your house. <laughs> really? Uh, there was no human involved. They were using all software. Mm -hmm. I think they're actually using, Wall Street's actually using humans. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the difference. I think they have people in areas that, I don't know yep. if they're realtors. They must be realtors. I would love to hook up with one of them. <laughs> you know, um, and, the, and they're, they're actually using brokers to buy these, you know, actually checking areas, checking rents, checking visibility on the property. I mean, 
I don't know where uh, Zillow's at, but I know they had a huge portfolio of properties they were trying to dump across the U.S. and they were stuck with them. Is that maybe the difference is Wall Street's hanging on to them? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. they are a longer term play. So yeah. I think to, yeah. to some extent, the folks on Wall Street, they're following an established process. And I think yeah. Zillow is trying to circumvent that process. Yeah. They're, they're trying to create a different process yeah. which, on, uh, at scale, which is not effective. And one, one of the things is, you know, we're talking about ethical. Zillow is not ethical. Okay. They will come in. First off, they, they make my job so much harder. I go sit down in a listing appointment. Yeah, and Zillow, and Zillow, yeah. How come Zillow, how come that house over there is worth more than mine? And also, they will tell you that they're not going to charge you. You're going to eliminate. You've heard these commercials. We're going to eliminate all the realtor fees, the headaches of open house. Open house to me is my go-to. That's where I sell. It's not. It's it's still a. Uh, it's like this. It's human. It's a human thing. It's a. It's still a people business. And Zillow's trying to make it a tech business. And I don't think real estate will ever be attempted. <laughs> yeah. And I think Zillow's making huge mistakes. So they, they tell you that they're going to eliminate. They end up charging you 7 to 8%. What's a realtor charge? Body. So it actually costs more if you use Zillow. So just saying. Okay. That's wow. it. Any other questions? Great presentation. Yeah. Yeah.